Hello everyone at home. My name is Holly Bronstein and I'm the CEO of the movement called Darkin, the largest grassroots movement in Israel that promotes uh, moderate values and tries to organize and mobilize a moderate majority of Israelis. And in the year uh, that has passed, we've been campaigning for separation from the Palestinians and we've been opposing the attempts to annex the West Bank in Israel. Before well, I think the Israeli, the Israeli media in that aspect is not much different from other countries, other Western countries. It's a process of getting women more um, upfront and center in terms of political debates about security and state issues. It's much easier, I feel like, to get women into panels about financial issues, family issues, educational issues, but when they have a panel about um, say, a negotiation uh, or a state solution. Uh, it's much easier to get a man in to sit at that panel. Uh, I think we do have, we do see a progress in that respect because, uh, first of all, a lot of the main anchors in the news in Israel are females. They're women. And so the fact that a woman is leading uh, the panel is, of course, a major, major uh, progress for the viewers at home and for women in that profession who want to get ahead up. Um, I think there are a lot of female experts in that field that don't get the uh, proper representations and they don't get asked as much to come and talk about their experiences, uh, but I feel like that is in progress. The media might have it easier to have women as the grieving mothers when it comes to like if during wartime or operation time, it's much easier to interview women as grieving mothers or sisters uh, than it is to bring them as experts on uh, security issues, which I feel we are progressing and I think it's getting a little better and it's very, very important that they are represented. It's a different voice. It's an important voice, and I feel like we're heading in the right direction in that term. I don't think there's a scheme of men trying to inhibit women from participating in negotiations or uh, political correspondence or anything like that. But I do feel that the discourse in general, when it comes to conflict, when it comes to war, when it comes to anything where that involves or entails military, First of all, we all know the military discourse in Israel, especially when it comes to the conflict, obviously. Uh, and the codes, the symbols, everything that, they, that we use in the language is very, is comprised of what's referred to as masculine codes. To answer your question, I do feel that that might inhibit or deter women from taking part. There is a hegemony, it's a masculine hegemony. It uh, relates to the weapons industry, it relates to the uh, anchors and news and uh, correspondence, and Helmut Ali and Dana Weiss, the whole kerfuffle that we saw in March 2016, Helmut Ali, a leading military and political correspondent, basically dismissed what she had to say. And she exhibited a, what they referred to as a very feminist agenda or, or mindset. Perhaps the conflict, the international conflict, is not necessarily radical Islam or Islam versus the Western world, but of radicals and extremists versus moderates. And it was dismissed, and she, the, the, to Eldi Ali said, you don't really know what you're talking about. I said, oh, maybe I need to keep my own feminist uh, internal affairs and so on. And lo and behold, less than a year and a half after, she was appointed as a leading political correspondent for China too. So now, little girls, everyone will see Dana Weiss in this leading position, primetime news, talking about the conflict politics, and I think that will help increase the uh, number of women we see in politics and media in the future. So, um, Haredi women don't really have a voice in politics. I was invited to the Committee for Women's Issues, and um, so the Arab women were presenting how low their numbers are on municipal um, committees and also on national, you know, the uh, number of MKs they have. Then it came my turn, it's literally zero. There are no Haredi women appointed in any political position in Israel. So that's just to begin with, um, the position of uh, Haredi women. Um, in general, Haredi politics are not an open, a 
of fear. They're not democratic internally. Meaning, also men don't have um, they don't have like a, a way of getting in. There's there's like a hegemony inside of the of the Haredi community, and that let's say I don't know how much it is, but let's say it's ten percent of people, and that ten percent is all men. But the rest of all the men are in the same position as the women. They don't really have any way of expressing a voice. Um, I do think that in the end, I don't know if it's, a, if it's just one disadvantage or a double disadvantage, but I didn't serve in the army, and I don't know anything about the military in Israel. Like in that sense, I'm not Israeli. I, I don't understand military um, jargon and slang. I mean, I learn it, but it's it's like foreign to me. I, I never served. I don't I don't know what the terms mean. In that sense, I'm the same. I'm on the same playing field as men in my community because they also don't serve in the military. So what what gives uh, men in the secular in general is really public an advantage doesn't give them an advantage. Even the MKs, I'm friends with one one of the Haredi MK sons. So I asked him one time just over dinner, you know. If I asked your father and he was in a good mood, what, what suggestion would he give me? And he sits on the, on the defense committee. I said, well, what would he suggest for the conflict? What, what's he for? What's he against? He said, I have no idea. I said, really? You never discussed it? He said, I don't think he has any idea either. And he's been in the Knesset for over a decade. And he, didn't, he doesn't have an opinion on the matter. It's not what concerns him. He's concerned with internal politics and internal issues, whatever they may be, whether it's funding for Yeshivot or avoiding draft for Haredi men or all kinds of, or housing or education, there's plenty of things to deal with, but that issue isn't even like, it's not a main issue in my community. Um, for me it is, and that's how I became involved in anything political. And from there I continued on to be involved in other things, but that, that personally was a trigger for me. I think we should begin with saying that um, only a quarter of the 120 MKs are women, which is, I think, the largest number we ever had. That's from um, 2015 on. And they come from all parties, except for the two Haredi uh, parties. And um, I should say something about the Loni Chorot, Lobo Chorot. I was a spokesperson, and we got to the Supreme Court, and they said, you are too late. Uh, I think it's just an excuse to not deal with that because this is still a very, very, very uh, difficult, um, a difficult matter in Israel. Uh, but yet, with what Lina said, now it's a fact that women do go to politics like Haredi women, or even just, um, just religious, I would say. And in the end, uh, I think that if we have women presenting news in, um, I think, all of the channels, the three leading channels, and quarter of women in the Knesset, which is the parliament, and two women in one of the most uh, important uh, committees in the government, it's a progress. If I may add, uh, to put things in a sort of global perspective, uh, because my previous job, I dealt a lot with comparisons between Israel and the UK. And the numbers in terms of politicians, members of parliament, members of press, ministers, and so on, uh, they're actually quite similar. And in terms of our region, I mean, we take a lot of pride by knowing that you know, we are in a, what the right might refer to as a tough neighborhood, and so on, uh, or sometimes a worse terminology. You don't see very often grassroots organization or a successful, um, effective grassroots organizations like Lonely Chorot, Lobo Chorot, or like what's going on in the Israeli uh, Arab community, as you see in our region. But you know, Britain is known as a beacon of Western ideology, liberalism, feminist ideologies, and so on. So to realize that actually what's happening um, in reality is actually very similar to Israel nowadays, and it's quite uh, inspiring. Us, as um, an organization that has over 2,000 people and supporters in Israel, which is a very, very large support base. Yeah, 220,000, which I didn't want to say exactly because I didn't remember if, if maybe higher by now. We have a lot of power, and so the MKs do talk to us, and they do correspond with us, and they do ask us 
our opinion. And that for us is bringing this organization, which is very uh, female oriented as well, to influence how women uh, are intertwined within uh, the state solution and uh, political debates about security and about the future of Israel, which I feel like is a very, very good way to bring it. Because I feel like you should, we should do it in a positive way, not just like a battle, because I feel like in previous generations, women battled, and this is, we should thank them because we're here today. And I feel like now we need to kind of prove how we can move forward. And I feel like whereas before the military experience was very key in how a person was um, perceived, if they can talk about the state solution or not, I feel like we're moving towards the fact that it's not as key. Whereas before, I feel, I feel like that was key. So I think that's a good progress that we're contributing to as our kingdom. There is a, a, a danger there, though, I think, between the separation between civic society and politics and media. Right. Because the civic society is almost uh, you know, stereotypically known as something that deals with what's referred to as supposedly feminine issues, civic society, aid, welfare, health, and so on and so forth, without always affecting uh, politics. And I Which is why I feel like this is so great, because this is what we do. We support this two-state solution. This is not a female organization for uh, female health issues or educational issues. We're dealing with the subject matter that we are saying that is mostly male-dominated, but we are a very, very strong player in that field. Okay, so we should open with talking about civil society itself and how many organizations we have in it uh, which are controlled and um, being um, led by women. And that is quite the opposite of what's going on on site in our world and also the private sector, which is full, we're filled with women, women like leading women, strong women, marvelous thing to see. They always say that um, CEOs and managers or um, members of Knesset or even the prime the ex 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 prime minister were like a mainly women and I don't think it's the uh, situation today I think that we have like nice and strong all together uh, I think it's the biggest project that the civil society has these days uh, I think it's our biggest part in the course of things and um, it depends on all of us okay so I want to give my perspective. I always um, introduce myself as a political activist, not as a civil society activist. I'm, <laughs> I'm interested in politics because it's, it's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. It's wanting to be where the decisions are made. That's a different story. It's a different game. And that's where I want to be and that's where I want other women to be from my community and other communities. There's a Beit Midrash in my home that takes place for, it's been going on for a year and a half. I founded it. There are 10 women that study Talmud in my house, Masechet Kiddushin, um, every Wednesday night. And the first question I always get is, there's so many things to learn, why do you have to learn that? Because that is what Jews, who are men, have been doing for 2,000 years, and that's the text that they've been studying, and that's the text that guides everything I do in my life. So that's what I want to learn. I feel that the NGOs is like, in an analogy, it's the same way. It's like, that. why don't you do that? I don't want to do that. I want to do that. I'm very inspired by a movement called Women Wage Peace in Israel that is now bringing uh, not just the voice of women, the voice of mothers. And they don't just do it in Israel. They try to do it together with the other side of the fence with the Palestinian women saying, you know, to the leadership in Israel and the Palestinian Authority, enough. We don't care how you do it. We don't care what is the solution at the end. Just sit together and find a way to solve this conflict. You know, we're gonna pressure you until you sit down and come up with a solution. Is that kind of the woman's voice which is missing uh, from you know, the attempts to resolve the conflict? Can we change our reality just by having more women sitting uh, inside a table? And for that matter, I wanna say, we are not a radical movement, we're a very pragmatic movement. We don't want to uh, send men back home and tell them, thanks for what you did, you failed. 
Now we're going to do it our way, the woman's way. That's not what we're suggesting, but we do uh, suggest having more women because we think it will change the dynamics, because we think it will change the atmosphere, some of the style that is being used today to negotiate. And let's face it, we are not negotiating. We're sitting here today, it's 2017, and everything is stuck. We're not doing anything with the Palestinians. Strong men on both sides are you know, digging their heels in the ground and saying, no more, we've done compromising, we're done negotiating, it's your fault, the other side's fault. No talks, we're not talking. And when we're not talking, for sure, we're not gonna change reality, we're not gonna go anywhere, because by doing things uh, unilaterally, we're not going to change our reality. One of the most important UN resolutions, which Owen and I were discussing earlier, was the resolution that women have to be a certain percentage, I don't remember the certain percentage, of all negotiations. And in Israel, which implements that law, uh, is there's a new organization called Forum Dvora, and they're an organization of ex-military, ex-Shabak uh, and Mossad uh, females in Israel uh, that are supporting the rising of women in negotiations and as part of the political uh, dialect about security. So I feel that's a very good bright spot for me. I feel like uh, maybe negative spot would be the cultural differences when we come to negotiations with Palestinian Authority and Israel as a Western country is trying to make women as more present as possible and Palestinian Authority does not have any female politicians in it. I'm aware that women have a different voice but I don't always like to address that because I feel like it's sometimes not the most complimentary thing, like when people say women bring a different voice, they sometimes mean um, they're very nice, they're very flexible, um, it's true. So it helps in certain senses, like that if you're less threatening, you can use that advantage and you know advance issues that you want through that. But in general, I think it's also a question of statistics. A very small amount of people want to be in the position of negotiation and you're automatically removing 50% of those people by, by teaching them at a very young age that they don't belong there. So you're losing out, just like in the workforce, if you don't have enough women, you're losing out on a lot of good people just by doing that. Again, it's not about changing a, a woman instead of a position of a man, it's about having influence that touches all aspects of society. 